All right, I think we're uh, ready to start here. Welcome everyone to the final panel of the day. My name is Chris Sheeran. Our topic is building a brand and attracting customers without breaking the bank. I guess that's really the kind of the subheader. Really, it's the, it's the executive panel. So for those of us, um, I'll go through our background a little bit, but I'm a private equity guy. Um, you know, we had the investment banker panel and a private equity panel and, and um, so, so Particularly that's the private equity. We want to, you know, we want to be in front of investment bankers when they have a deal to show us, so we can be top of mind when they have a deal, and we'll partner with senior lenders and and, and mes providers and, and put together a balance sheet for a deal, and we'll work with accounting firms and law firms and um, and, and other professionals in, in executing a deal. And so, you know, those those groups I described encompass probably the majority of you. Um, we're always kind of envious, I, I think. Um, the private equity guys are, are, or, or are always at least, uh, you know, desperately trying to find management talent, and so we're, we're a little bit envious of, of people like our panelists today that who, who are actually doing things and uh, and, and operating and, and building businesses and making things happen on the ground, um, as opposed to you know me parachuting into a, a board meeting once a quarter and, and working on strategy. That's great, but. Um, Doing it day to day, these these are the guys that make the magic happen. So um, uh, I'm pretty excited to have this this panel here. So uh, we, we talked a little earlier about um, <clears throat> in the panel before about about uh, brand building and the importance of brands. So we're going to go a little bit deeper in that. And really, um, we just want to kind of take a, uh, a a chance to hear these guys' stories uh, because I think there's they all have some really interesting and, and diverse perspectives. Um, real quickly, uh, I'm, if you guys could just briefly introduce yourselves, and we'll go back and. Again, go back uh, a little bit more deeply into each of your backgrounds and get your perspective. So, Chris. So I'm Chris Hamer. Um, and so we're talking about background, or just 30 seconds 30 on seconds. that. Chris Hamer, marketer. I uh, was at Priceline.com in the early days, sort of the Shatner era. And then General Motors, uh, OnStar, and Cadillac, so big brand. And Sony Music, iHeartRadio, and brand development roles. And now I'm the founder of a small technology company that I've raised. Uh, friends and family and some, some venture money, and we'll talk about that later. That's Chris Aver from Westport, Connecticut. Uh, Justin Cups, I live in Wilson, New Jersey. Um, similar to Chris, I've been in brand management uh, for the better part of 23 years. I had an opportunity right out of school to work for a startup brand called Hand One Basketball. I had a chance to really take that from a really early stage uh, t-shirt brand to a global brand, uh, post that sale, uh, the opportunity to work in big global brands that uh, were in some cases pretty heavily distressed, most notably Adidas uh, in uh, 2008 to 2012, and then most recently in my role at Under Armour the last two years, and sandwiched in between there uh, a couple of opportunities through some private equity uh, funded uh, funding and run a startup business, and then most recently was trying to rebuild Gantt Sportswear in North America. Um, or three years prior to going to Under Armour. So, sort of the best of all worlds, if you will, uh, certainly uh, in, in my opinion, of being in small and distressed and aggressive growth. So, uh, proud to be here today. Hey guys, my name is Jim DeSico. I'm the oldest brother and CEO of a company called Super Coffee. Uh, my two younger brothers and I started Super Coffee four years ago as tired student athletes. Uh, today we're 80 full-time, 150 part-time employees based here in New York City. We've raised um, 25 million in venture capital, uh, distributed nationwide, uh, a healthy blend of retail and e-commerce, um, and getting ready to raise our Series B. So, uh, fitting time for this conversation. Great, thanks, guys, and, and we'll look forward to uh, to hearing more of, of all your stories. That's really what we wanted to do. Is, is Lou and I were talking about um, kind of where we want to go with this. Uh, I so quick introduction to me. I, I said my name is Chris Shearer, and I'm with Longhouse Partners. We're a private equity firm based out of Detroit. Uh, been in private equity for a number of years, um, and co-founded co uh, Longhouse about a year and a half ago. And the the two investments we've made thus far are both in the kind of direct marketing space. Uh, the first is a Primarily a direct mail business, I guess I should call it. The investment bankers in the room would probably slap me and tell me to call it an omni-channel marketing company. Uh, but really, it's primarily direct mail, um, kind of a monthly coupon magazine you get in the mail. Um, that, that business is just kind of impossible to kill. And people who think direct mail is dying, I just tell go go look at your mailbox and tell me uh, tell me otherwise. Uh, something like 53 percent of the U.S. Postal Service traffic is is, is advertisements um, because it works. Um, it's 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 expensive. 
uh, on a relative basis, but it still has the highest response rate of, of just about any form of advertising. Um, and, and so we believe in it. So that was our first investment. Our second investment uh, is in the residential flooring space. Uh, if you think about Empire uh, Carpet, um, this is a regional competitor to Empire. So uh, our business outsources all of the, the installation of the flooring and carpet, for mostly for residential homes. Um, so it's really a sales and marketing lead generation business. And so, um, you know, marketing has been very top of mind for me. I just spent yesterday in Phoenix at our, at our first board meeting with our flooring company, um, talking at great length about, um, you know, how we're allocating, you know, we're going to spend five or six million dollars in advertising. The company's about a thirty-five million dollar business, um, and, and advertising is our, our, our biggest cost. And so, um, I spent a lot of time figuring out what's the what's the mix. You know, how much should we be spending on TV? versus uh, you know, online, social media, uh, even some direct mail, they've done some billboards, they've kind of done a bunch of different things. And so we're, we've, we've struggled with um, kind of attribution and, and really measuring all that, but that's something that's, that's been pretty near and dear to my heart. So um, Chris, I'm, I'm gonna start with you. You've got uh, a number of different, I think, stories you can tell. Uh, you've had a lot of different interesting brands and businesses, many of which we recognize. Um, but, but maybe just to start, um, maybe pick a, a couple of them, but if you could tell uh, the, the Priceline story uh, and the OnStar story, at, at least to start, because I think they're both fascinating. Sure, it's, it's, thanks Chris, it takes us back a while, but um, pre-IPO, Priceline.com, whole new uh, travel category, actually created the, the, really the, the, the category of uh, selling old unsold seats. It uh, wasn't my idea, but I was part of the marketing team to bring in Bill Shatner and then to go on radio. So really going against the grain of what big brands were doing at the time. Radio was a funny, funny way to reach people, but kind of like direct mail. It doesn't get the cred, but it delivers the, it, it delivers the goods because people are in their, their cars, they listen to radio. So that was the Shatner story, and that really, and using, using Bill Shatner hit them kind of off the, off the map for quite a while. We brought him back, and then he lost his mind again, perhaps. <laughs> After he got $10 million, we gave him some stock, and he sold it right away, and was proud that he sold the stock. And he was saying, I sold my $10 million of stock. That made, it, was, it was good for, 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 uh, for Priceline. I then went to, to OnStar at General Motors, and actually a similar story. They, had spent, they were spending all this incredible money on television and had licensed the Batman, Warner Brothers Batman, and it just didn't resonate at all. It was, sort of classic General Motors spending $60 million a year and it was going, there was no, no brand recognition, no connection to the product, no desire to have the product. So I brought in radio and I brought in, you might remember, some young people might not, but the, the Real Stories campaign of actual recordings of actual things that were happening in your car and what OnStar was doing to save people's lives. And so, and help people get into their locked out Get, that lock, uh, get into the cars and they're locked out and things like that. So that used radio and we were very effective. We, we, were, we spent only a couple million bucks the first round and we, our awareness went to like in the 90s from in the 50s. And the, the, the desire to want the product, which is the key thing, right, went almost to the top. Like everybody interviewed who, knew the, who, who had listened to a spot or two, they wanted the product. So you don't have to spend a lot of money, you just have to think about how to reach the people in, in the context in which they are thinking about or maybe thinking about your product. I think that's so sort of how, was, how hard was it to convince the, uh, the, the folks in, within the dinosaur that is General Motors to uh, adopt this, this new strategy? Um, you know, I was a guy from, from Connecticut coming into a company at General, you know, General Motors that absolutely eats, it used to anyway, eats and spits out the people from outside of the city of Detroit. So, um, I, I knew I was right. I had some credibility from the East Coast. It was sort of a balance of that, but it was not easy. There were a lot of people. But when you're a marketer, when you're a marketer, and these guys can attest. You have a lot of bosses. Everybody knows marketing. Everybody's husbands know bot, no marketing. Everybody's wives know marketing. Everybody's kids are in college studying marketing. They can tell you all the stuff you're doing wrong and what you should be doing. That said, we um, did some testing, and I'm not a big wasn't a big campaign tester. But we went down to Atlanta and ran some spots and tested. And it was like, we were blown away by, by the uh, results of this testing. And, um, and I brought that back to my president, who had the courage to go against sort of senior GM people at the Renaissance Center. Um, so 
it took some hard work. We took some took some bullets, but um, we got it through. And then and then proof is in the pudding when it started to really work. When we were mocked on uh, Jay Leto at the time and other like uh, Howard Stern and you know things like that, then 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 you know you you've broken into culture. Great. And, well, and I want to go back and talk about Crowdflick, um, but, but I'm, I guess I'm kind of getting a little bit of a maybe a little bit of history of, of, of how some of these campaigns have worked and, and how these brands have been built. Um, and before we get to to Jim, who's uh, you know kind of doing it real time here, uh, but but Justin, um, again, kind of like Chris, I, I think at a similar time you were doing something really interesting, um, really cool, really unique that that I saw from from the outside, and it was kind of fun to you know to meet you you know after the fact. But but if you could tell that and one story for again people of a, of a certain age in here um, who you know enjoyed the you know. Skip to Malou and uh, the professor and all the uh, the guys in the M1 mixtape tour, which might mean nothing to probably you know half the people in this room, but but I thought it was was, was a lot of fun. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> so the story, uh, as Chris was talking about, which was awesome to know you were uh, a consumer as well of the brand, but uh, and one basketball uh, was a company that was founded in 1993 uh, by three three really two really close friends from the New York City area. Uh, and then a friend of theirs who had gone to undergrad at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, they started this t-shirt company, uh, which was, at the time was all about trash t-shirts. So anybody who's played basketball, loves basketball, plays in the park. Uh, I was a basketball player. Uh, you have great appreciation for trash talking as a part of the game. They took that element, uh, which was such a great connection point for a lot of the consumers, took that to t-shirts, um, and voila, you know, had invented what they thought was a brand, what really was a t-shirt company at the time aspiring to be a brand. And so if you then uh, fast forward that I joined the brand three years in as a 25th person doing $25 million, <clears throat> I thought it was the greatest thing of all time. I called my parents and I was like, wow, I get to wear shorts and t-shirts every single day and they pay me every two weeks and we get to play hoops a couple of days a week. So this whole work thing is, is pretty cool. Um, and obviously they, they knew that that was not the case, but uh, I also didn't realize at the time, I realized a few years later, uh, as much as I was having fun with the brand, I realized how close we also were to going out of business. Uh, so that's probably a different panel as far as talking about how we navigate that. But um, you know, the story really was how do you go out and try to compete with sort of this aspiration of becoming the number one basketball brand in the world when you're up against the big behemoth out in Beaverton that is Nike. And, uh, you know, when you're going through that, you're certainly uh, trying to talk to all those family members to convince them that we're not crazy and we know we can go do this. Um, because, quite honestly, that's a lot of it. And what Jim's going through that, you know, right now is just convincing yourself that you can go do and be whatever you want to be. Um, so I think you have to have sort of that, like, we're going to go take on the world. And that's very different than then executing upon that vision and what you want to be. And so if you fast forward through, there were plenty of steps along the way where we had a lot of people tell us what we couldn't do, uh, but we had a vision for the brand and what we wanted to become, that we wanted to become more than t-shirts and wanted to become apparel. We wanted to eventually get into footwear, which if you actually look today at the number of consumer products, sports brands that have transferred from an apparel brand to a footwear brand, that list is super, super tiny. I'm actually one today where we are a, a global dominant apparel brand that is continuing 15 years in to try to become a, a more relevant footwear brand. Um, and so as we move forward, you know, the challenge was how do you become noticed? How do you go against these big brands? And for us, it was trying to constantly find this emotional currency or this, this emotional connection with our consumer. And so a couple stories I'll tell you about what we did because I think as you're trying to do that, you're trying to be big and bold and take big risks. And in some of those risks, it's something that can put you out of business. Um, but I think you have to do that. And, and we did that a couple of different times. Uh, most notably, uh, for those of you who know or follow the Knicks and or follow uh, the NBA, Latrell Sprewell was a very uh, polarizing figure in the NBA. Uh, this is about 1999. He was playing for the Golden State Warriors and had an altercation with his coach. It's uh, a polite term. Yes. Yeah. He choked Google, his coach. He, he choked his coach. <laughs> <laughs> we did not condone that. Um, and it was crazy, right? So this guy was sort of getting, um, you know, uh, kicked out of the NBA at the time. Nobody wanted to touch him with, you know, a 10-foot pole. 
And we saw an opportunity to say, you know what, we certainly aren't condoning what this guy did, but this is our this is a guy who we can connect with, right? This is a guy from the inner city who didn't have any money. Uh, all he wanted to do was ball, and that guy speaks to us. Alan Iverson, those guys spoke to who we were trying to be as a brand. We couldn't relate to a guy like Grant Hill, whose dad played in the NFL, his mom was a Capitol Hill lawyer, and he went to Duke. Like that just wasn't the kid that we could connect with. And so we took a huge swing. We signed Latrell Sprewell. We put out that we would sign, we would pay his fine. Uh, and so people thought we were crazy and we certainly upset a few moms who were shopping at JCPenney's and all these other places. But the amount of media support and brand recognition because when Latrell Sprewell during that three or four months happened, um, right behind Latrell Sprewell choking his coach was and one just signed him and said they would pay for um, is fine. And look, the story only gets better because we ran a great commercial that connected about the American dream. And then the Knicks went to the NBA finals that year. So there were plenty of steps along the way where that whole strategy could have imploded and the brand could have gone down with it. But I think it speaks to once again, and there are a lot of those examples of taking big risks, being bold, trying to challenge the status quo. And, and uh, fortunately, it worked out for us. And you know, the next three years for us was an unbelievable run. There's a similar story about Vince Carter winning the dunk contest in our shoes, totally lucky. Um, and we went from a $25 million business to a $250 million business in four years uh, with a number of contributing factors. And um, so it was, you know, again, just a lot of, you know, boldness and then also a good amount of luck along the way in, uh, in growing that brand. Great, thanks. Uh, so, so Jim, you, um, some people may be familiar with your story. I don't know if I, I was, but uh, you know, I, I've gotten a little bit familiar with it. I think it's it's a it's a good one. So, uh, tell us how uh, how your brother started the business and kind of how you, you built it to here. You know, what are some of the obstacles you you had to overcome and kind of how you've done it? Totally. So, um, like I said, my brothers and I were college athletes, and if it weren't for that, I don't think we'd be able to do this. Right? We we didn't realize the game or the fight that we were signing up for, and. and as student athletes, we were tired, and, and on campus there wasn't anything that we wanted to drink. Everything was loaded with sugar, high calories, dominated by the Starbucks Frappuccino. Um, so for us, we brewed coffee with two cups of coffee per bottle, zero sugar. We added some protein to it, tasted good, we sold it to our teammates and our classmates and our coaches. And we said, hey man, there's an opportunity here, right? So a bottle of coffee is a $2 billion industry. The Frappuccino does $1.8 billion. Let's get started. And, and for me, I studied philosophy at Colgate University. I played football. I, I knew nothing about business or startups. Like my mom worked for the YMCA. Our dad was a construction worker. Like this, we didn't know what we were gonna sign it up for, but we uh, we knew we had a product that tasted good, worked for us, and there were other people like us. So like, let's sell this stuff. And uh, the thing we didn't know is to get started, like uh, grocery stores. To, to get into a grocery store, you need a distributor. And to get a distributor, you need grocery stores to sell to. So for us, we had neither of those things. Uh, we're like. Let's just deliver it ourselves. Let's make it ourselves. Let's let's get into a store. This was before Amazon owned Whole Foods back in like the, this fall of 2015. So we, we brewed a batch in my brother's dorm room. We, we poured it into some empty bottles and we put like a FedEx Super Coffee sticker on it. And we, we showed up at Whole Foods and we said, hey, we're Super Coffee. You guys carry nothing like this. It was, it was one store in Washington, D.C. at the time. Jake was playing football at Georgetown. So we launched in D.C. Uh, and the guy was like, this tastes pretty good. We'll give you guys a shot. And we knew that that was an opportunity, right? You give us an inch, we're gonna take a mile. And that first day we showed up to make a delivery, we stayed there and poured samples until we broke that store's weekly sales record in the first few hours. And we're like, all right, this is a simple strategy, it's just not an easy one. Like, we, if, we, if we work here hard enough, we're gonna, we're gonna sell a lot of coffee. So we did that at that store for about a month. We went to another store, did the same thing. Another store did the same thing. And at the end of our first year, we had 50 stores doing a quarter million dollars in sales, just the three of us driving around making deliveries. We were able to raise money off of that very local story we created. Um, Shark Tank heard about what we were doing, so we, we flew out to LA, we got to, to pitch on Shark Tank with Mark Cuban and the gang. Uh, we didn't do a deal, but as you can imagine, it was good for, for business, good for raising money in, in the private market. So, so, so when was that, what year, what? Uh... So we filmed in 2017 in June, uh, but the episode didn't air until February 2018. It was, it was 18 months after we started the company. Uh, and that, stre that was stressful from June to February. We had no idea when that thing was coming on, uh, and nor did we know how they were gonna edit it. Um, so that was a, a nice catalyst for, for growth. It's sort of, I mean, it's reality TV, but it was validating for a lot of investors, a lot of buyers, 
Uh, we were able to raise money. We sort of scrapped together these like convertible notes for two or three years, uh, and really on a shoestring, you know. And uh, once we had like we went from 250 grand in sales to a million to five million. We just did 30 million in 2019 on our way to 100 this year if we close the Series B. Wow. Um, but that, that said, it's been the same strategy since day one, and now we've just scaled it. We, we uh, like I said, it's a simple strategy. It requires just being in stores, and, and we don't have a big marketing budget. You guys know what that was like. And uh, for us, it's our marketing is in stores. It's it's displays that we build with our bottles. Um, we sort of went with this iconic stripe that that stands out in a otherwise dark coffee set. Uh, and we, we pledged that we're going to outwork the big guys, the, the Cokes and the Pepsis of the world. And, uh, we hired a lot of student athletes, a lot of people that were competitive and, and hungry. And uh, now this year, we, uh, we just hired one of Justin's colleagues from, from Under Armour to, uh, to ramp up the marketing, marketing spend and, and hopefully drive some brand awareness. So how, how, I'm curious how big of a, of a boost or spike did you get from the, from the Shark Tank exposure? Yeah, oh, it was, it was cool at first. Like that, that the night it aired, um, we we did like ten times the sales online, and like, and, and we prepared for it. We sent a lot of inventory into our, our fulfillment centers, uh, but then it like two years later, we're still talking about it. You know, that 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 fifteen minute minutes of fame on, fame on a Sunday night, like it is what you make it. So we've stretched it out. We put it on signs and posters. We talk about it on podcasts. Like so, we've been flaunting it so much that Shark Tank called us and was like, "Guys, you got you got to stop doing this." You're <laughs> <laughs> not supposed to say that stuff, uh, but it's, it's working. <laughs> so, so you mentioned you're doing doing podcasts and events like this, but but uh, how how, would, how you kind of roughly in, in broad chunks? How how would you allocate your your various marketing efforts? Yeah, um, I would say 90%, probably 80% of what we do is field marketing. Brand ambassadors in stores, and we don't use staffing agencies, we don't use um, contractors, like we, we hire people, we train them, uh, and they, they work for Super Coffee. You know, they're not wearing a Red Bull hat in the morning and a Sencha hat at night. Like they work for Super Coffee, they're bought into the story, um, and there's no better connection than that, that human feel. Like our brand is about positive energy, so we want that to resonate from, from our team into our customers. Um, and now we're, we're just starting to amplify that message through digital. So typical like paid social stuff on Facebook and Instagram. Um, that works for, for direct consumer sales. 20% of our business is, is re, uh, online sales. Um, but those ads also lift up retail. You know, it's just less less trackable. You, sounds like what some would refer to as guerrilla marketing, what you're doing in the stores. You guys call it that or? Yeah, yeah. We, uh, it's make space or take space. Is, and uh, we do it obviously politely and appropriately, but we're, we're pretty aggressive. And, and uh, the, now we have the sales to prove it, right? Like our, our brand will sell more than the other coffees in this set. So as the buyer of this set, you should take more super coffee. Right, so it's telling this data story and, and really earning that story. And, and uh, now that we're, we're getting to this point of uh, we can pull back a little bit on the human support, and, and the, the brand is uh, is pulling through. Okay, great. I want to come back and talk about how what, what your competitors are doing in response, because uh, we're going to talk about kind of the you know what, what the what the big companies how the big companies respond to, to upstarts. But but Chris, if you could tell the. Uh, the, the crowdflick story, uh, yeah, because it's very different from what you're doing before, right? Sure. So uh, way different from from uh, from Jim's story. So uh, six years ago, I came. Uh, I had been at Sony Music and around the entertainment space and technology from Priceline Days and, and OnStar, and I came up with some a technology flow that synchronized video from multiple mobile devices. Uh, it happened actually at the Jimmy Kimmel show at Dave Matthews concert. The um, I then wrote up some some patent applications and hired a lawyer and raised raised some friends and family money and and went on to launch an app called Crowdflip that you would download on your phone and you and your friends would film and you could share video and you could create multi-cam videos. That's that is what Crowdflip is. But it's hard as can be to go out and grow, you know, Instagram or TikTok to go to 100 million users overnight. Those are truly lightning in a bottle things, and you'd be hard pressed to invest in something thinking that they can get to that scale. However, for, for us, along the way, we've gotten now 13 patents issued around the world. I just, a year, one year ago, I was in Munich and received US, uh, uh, European patents. So I'm heavily patent protected now. So a year ago, I shifted from a direct-to-consumer model to an enterprise model. So now it's the whole game has changed. Now, we, now our mission is to take what we do in our technology and put it into other apps. So it could be an ESPN app, golf, golf app, NASCAR, WWE, on and on and on, education apps are anywhere. 
And as it would now happen, now there's a chance that we'd actually be sold to somebody who, somebody else, a big player who would then implement our 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 uh, our strategy. So that's so it's so you have to be you have to be. I think the, the key thing is, and for this panel certainly is you have to be flexible and see what you have and see the best way to go to market. Sure, it's a big ego boost to go and build build the next Snapchat. The likelihood is about less than zero. So, but if you have something and you know you can it can work somewhere. Are you built, able to flip, to to shift and, and, and change strategy and um, and make it work and have courage? I mean, I think I think Justin's courageous story about the Charles Mural is like that's balls, you know. So you have to you have to have that courage, and that's that's where we are now. So I think um, we're on the verge of that actually paying off. I believe it was the Charles Prewell. So how am, I, how am I supposed to feed my family on seven million dollars a year? Yeah. <laughs> exactly right. Was that was that after he was working for you? Or, or? Uh, I, I think after. Yeah. yeah. You, you made him so uh, successful. He was able to say that. Um, so let's 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 pivot a little bit and, and talk about you know you know Chris and Justin. You both have also have some kind of big corporate experience in in dealing with you know upstarts who you know may have caught lightning in a bottle and you're like yeah you know you'll see folks running circles around you. Um, so, you know, Chris, you left, uh, where when you were, you were at General Motors, you did this kind of entrepreneurial thing, you know, at OnStar. OnStar was this kind of growing, burgeoning, you know, young, new brand within within a big company. You did so well, they, they kicked him upstairs to Cadillac. So, uh, talk about that experience, right? Very, very, very different. Very different. I went from uh, doing radio, radio commercials that we were producing ourselves in Birmingham, Michigan, to, uh, actually, I just read, uh, one of the brands, Hard Rock Hotel, was doing a 60-second commercial in the Super Bowl. We were we did a 60-second in the 2003 Super Bowl, the, the 60, and did a 90 to launch the XLR in, in 2003, right? Or maybe it was 2004. The money is just like ridiculous amount of money that you spend. However, your Cadillac, it's a brand. It's the it's the big event. You get a lot of value from that. Um, it's a lot different than than uh, doing Facebook Facebook ad Facebook. Group or, or ads or, uh, or Google AdWords, but being a big brand is pretty exciting. You know, it, they all have their risks. Yeah. So, so how you know who, who I'm not sure who you may have viewed as, as uh, some of the upstarts or the, or the smaller competitors at the time, um, but can you think about how uh, you know how Cadillac kind of dealt with them? They're, sure, there were luxury brands were spending a lot less than us, and you know BMW never spent as much as Cadillac did in those days. They but they had a they had a fine uh, fine focus on engineering and performance. Porsche same, uh, Volvo on safety. So they were able to stay closer to a true brand identity, and that carried them beyond some of the big spends. I mean, they all spent a lot of money, but I think I think the brand as you build a brand, like these guys are talking about, you build a brand. You and you and you have the courage to stay on the brand compass. You can get further with the same amount, with the same spend or less. So maybe we had some tough times at, at GM with that. Mm -hmm. So Justin, how about you at at, at Under Armour? Um, you don't need to get too specific about uh, you know what what competitors might uh, give you fits, but uh, is, is it is it a matter of, of just you know being able to. Use the power, the, the spending power that you have. Is that your your first club that you use, or, or what is kind of the competitive response to the market? Yeah, I think um, you know my honest answer to that, having been in small companies where you're starving uh, and willing to take big bold risks, like I spoke about before, and, um, which I think is necessary. At the end of the day, um, you've really got to be willing to put it out there. And, and I think the fundamental difference between some of the smaller businesses where we didn't have big budgets and the big brands that we're at today where the budgets are enormous. Uh, I like to say to people that, you know, if you make a mistake uh, on the big brand, the lights flicker. If you make a mistake on the small brand, they go out. Um, and I think that's sort of the mentality that you have to have. But, you know, my honest answer is we don't spend enough time, in my opinion, at big brands looking at what all these upstarts are doing. and. You know, it's amazing to me when I hear Jim talk about some of the stuff that they're doing, the hand-to-hand -hand combat and sort of the guerrilla warfare, and you know, some of that stuff gets lost in the big budgets, right? Because you're comparing yourself against your bigger competitors, which in some cases is certainly the obvious thing to do, but meanwhile, you're typically getting flanked by all these different brands, and we did that when I was at one We flanked Nike and Adidas and, and found our way all of a sudden connecting with the consumers, but 
you know, I think that's one of the biggest challenges with a big brand. I think first of all, um, as much as people say sometimes they're working really, really hard, I think the hustle is just always very different. And I think you can't underestimate the hustle of entrepreneurs and what they're trying to do and the risks they're willing to take. Um, and I think, you know, again, from our standpoint, you lose sight of some of the stuff that is just the basic stuff that means and connects. And, and again, I mentioned earlier about the emotional connection, or, or like I said, emotional currency with the consumer. What is it? What are you constantly trying to find? Um, you know, when I was at Audi, uh, we were, I was running a big business for Adidas uh, that was really struggling. And one of the things that we actually spent a lot of money on was we went out and we hired brand ambassadors because we found ourselves in a situation where we were just continuing to do the same thing over and over and, and obviously expecting a different result that wasn't coming. And one of the things that, that my team and I put in place was let's just go back to the point of sale, let's go back to the point of retail. We did a secret shopping experience or experiment for 30 days. Um, and wouldn't you know, <clears throat> we thought we were really smart and brilliant in the boardroom about how these strategies and how we're gonna go win and how we're gonna get all these consumers. And what we forgot was that the gatekeeper for us to be to be most concerned about was the store employee at Foot Locker, in this case, or at Sports Authority, whatever it may be. And through that experience, we found that 80% of the time, the store associate never pulled our product out of the back room. Mm. And when you think about that, you know, your entire strategy, no matter how great it is, is blown up before it even gets a chance to get on the consumer. And so we went back, we really tripled down on this, this ambassador approach. We really focused on sort of this, uh, this tactic of educating, inspiring, and incentivizing these store associates. So they would want to pull us out. They would understand that we were speaking to them. We, we created this unbelievable network where we then started to have a two-way dialogue where they were giving us feedback on a monthly basis about where we could change our products and what we could do. And, and that's why I think about that, you know, it's, it's, it's what you have to do when you have no money in some cases. And sometimes it becomes sort of an afterthought when you have big budgets. And um, I just find that, you know, this, this uniqueness to be able to sort of take learnings from both um, certainly has served me well in, in each of the stops, whether it's been a small company or, or a big company. So, so Jim, you know, if you guys are 30 million, hopefully going to 100 million, that's that's amazing, right? So you, you got to be annoying some people, uh, your competitors in the market. I'm sure you've gotten some people's attention. I'm sure. Have you have you seen anything kind of firsthand? What uh, what you know? And, and first of all, maybe tell us who your biggest competitors are. Um, are they, I assume they're many of our brands we, we we perhaps know, but but what what has been kind of the competitive response this far? Yeah, so uh, for us, we're, we're after the Starbucks Frappuccino and the Dunkin' Donuts bottle coffee. And, and really, in the last six months, we've become the number one independent bottle coffee in the country behind Starbucks, Dunkin', and Java Monster. Um, there are some startups that, that have been doing this, something similar, Bulletproof Coffee, you guys have heard of, High Brew Coffee, um, and, and proud to, to have, have leapfrogged them. The thing that amazes me is like, we're not selling MCT oil and monk fruit and ketogenic and biohacking, you know, like we're not, all, our product does all of those things, but we're, it's 80 calories and zero sugar, right? We're, we appeal more to Walmart than we do to Whole Foods. Uh, yet Starbucks and Dunkin' and these bigger brands, those, those are both Pepsi and Coke, by the way, uh, continue to launch innovations that are loaded with sugar and calories. It's it, like, it it's mystifies us. And for us, it's low-hanging fruit. It's like, let them keep doing that. Um, but this year, we're, we're, we are starting to see some more uh, MCT oil, like zero sugar entrance into the into the space. Uh, nothing yet that has been positioned for, for the mainstream. And what, what is MCT oil for? Yeah, sorry. So MCT oil stands for medium chain triglycerides. It's just a, a healthy fat from coconut oil. And if you guys have heard of the keto diet, like our bodies burn fat for fuel, and the MCT oil sort of helps you get, get that. That's part of the reason we call it super coffee. It's good good for your energy. So where are the cal the calories are coming from? What? Um, so there's five grams of MCT oil. That's 40 calories, and then the rest is from 10 grams of protein. And then where is it? Where where is it positioned price wise versus the Dunkins or the or the Starbucks? Two ninety nine. So we're right in line. You'll see Starbucks and Dunkin from two seventy nine to three fifty. Okay. Um, one other uh, topic I mentioned, and, and we're not certainly going to solve this today because it's kind of the never ending you know. Uh, uh, question of, of advertiser marketers and, and, and those of us who uh, uh, make decisions on how much money is spent on advertising and marketing. Uh, but the, the, the concept of attribution and, and measurement of, of you know, the success or, or not of, of the particular ad dollar or, or particular program that you've, that you've um, uh, executed, 
uh, I, I'll, I'll throw it out to, to anybody, you know, Chris, maybe you've had, you know, uh, the biggest variety of, of stops along the way. If you have any, any thoughts on that, any, any general thoughts? Just a high, high level, I mean, I, I think more and more, because you can, you can track, you should. I think all the online stuff, I know all the online stuff, you can certainly track, and you can really, you can also shift very quickly from one, one placement or strategy to another, so you should be tracking, and for those of you who have portfolio companies, I guess there are some in here that have portfolio companies are spending advertising spend, they should be doing that, right? If there's, you know, if it's general market advertising, it's harder, <laughs> Um, but there, there should be tracking, and if it's online, absolutely be tracking. Yeah, I mean, look, I would second that. I think, you know, to me, in sort of this money ball era of the analytics, um, anything and everything that you can track at this point, just to inform um, sort of the gut instinct on this feels right, this looks right, let's go ahead and take a swing. Uh, it certainly doesn't mean it's going to be right, but I think um, in sort of this era of every dollar, matters and you've got to try to spend one like it's a hundred. Um, certainly the ability to be a bit more informed in those decisions I think has been very, very useful for us. Jim, I'm guessing as you're ramping up your, your digital advertising, that's probably near and dear to your heart. Yeah, yeah, and like Justin just said, spending one dollar as if it's a hundred, like what we're all trying to figure out is how do we spend one to make a hundred, right? Or in some cases, how do you spend one to make three, one to make four? Um, and for us, like that's been super close to the point of sale. So whether that's in stores, like if we do a demo for four hours with a, an actual rep pouring samples, we know how many bottles we sell, and then we also see the lift after the fact, like for the following weeks to come. Uh, and then online, it's much more measurable. Amazon, not so much, but our, our own website, drinksupercoffee.com. Like, if we're spending a dollar on Facebook, we're typically pushing them to our website, making four dollars. And then different things um, for for retention. We like direct to consumer a lot because like email marketing after those people have purchased, it's basically free. So how can we expend, uh, extend that lifetime value on those dollars spent? Uh, and uh, the last four years, our focus has been on garnering distribution. You know, we gotta be available before we can spend money on marketing. And we're not yet at the point where a billboard in Times Square makes sense. Uh, but the moment we're on every single shelf in an area, we will we'll spend more on that. You just can't really measure it. Right. Um, we have, I don't know, 15 or 14 minutes or so. We don't have to take up all of those minutes. But I certainly wanted to, to leave some time for, for questions uh, for anyone in the audience. Again, these guys have got, I think, just a really interesting mix of, of experiences and, and backgrounds and perspectives, um, which I was excited to talk to them about. So uh, any questions for our panel before we go to the bar? Not to <laughs> short maybe. So for Super Coffee. How did you, uh, when you were in that first Amazon store, uh, generating all that uh, <coughs> excitement, where were you making the coffee? Well, so the first batch was in Jordan's dorm room. Um, and really for six months, I, I can't believe this is legal. Like we were pretty much ma making it in a bathtub. You know, like we, we got a hundred gallon vat. We, none of us had FDA certifications or anything like that. We just make it, we bottle it. We, it was shelf stable for like 90 days, maybe 60. And we hope that we sold it fast before people got sick. And that's how we got uh, started. Oh my God. That's great. Lou, you might have to cut that, cut that part out. <laughs> I went to Georgetown. Those bathrooms are disgusting. <laughs> that's what makes it super. Um, so I think there are a lot of ways to spend marketing dollars where you can track attribution, you can track your return on ad spend. I think the field marketing teams in retail, that's easy to measure the return because you can see the lift. How do you think about other ways to drive retail sales? Because it's tough to attribute a spend to a lift in like spending digitally to drive retail. Like how do you how do you think about that? How do you measure that? That's something I know that we struggle with our portfolio companies that have retail distribution, how do you support those retailers and then measure the return? because you have, you have multi-channel distribution, it's hard to figure out where those dollars are driving volume. Yeah, I'm gonna piggyback off of Justin's answer. It's really cool that with, it was Adidas that you guys were going into the, the retailers, like an extension of our team is the people who actually stock the shelves, right? Like the people that work for the, the Whole Foods and the Walmarts of the world. Um, so you have to incentivize them and also incentivize the customers. So like you'll see us, we'll do branded mountain bikes and a store will order 100 cases and the customers have an opportunity to, to win that mountain bike. 
I think opportunities like that, you know what it costs the brand, but you have to have metrics in place, whether you're buying data from IRI or Nielsen or any syndicated sources, or if you're getting like distribu distributor depletion reports, like you'll see what the movement was in that store before you do a campaign like that, like a, a very local field marketing campaign, and then you can measure the, the lift afterwards. Um, again, it's very local, you know, like you're not gonna be able to, to do something like that in 4,500 Walmarts, but for us, we subscribe to the 80-20 the rule where 20% of our revenue, sorry, 80% of our revenue is gonna come from our top 20% of accounts. Uh, so put dedicate the resources to those best those best stores. Justin, you talked about incentivizing the uh, retail employees. Was that fine with the the ownership? Uh, yes, uh, that's the answer uh, that I. <laughs> yes. um, I mean, the short answer is yes. We we certainly did not. Um, go into those stores uh, and incentivize those associates without a blessing from the corporate office. There were some that really embraced it and then others felt like, you know, spiffs and things like that was not really something they wanted to do. But, um, you know, again, I, I just, I keep coming back to this, to this connection point um, and you get, you get really lost in, you know, trying to take over the world or trying to build the next product and, and the big difference for me does come back again to this connection point with your consumer, with the associates who are, who are moving your product. Obviously, you've got to find connection points with the products and the message you're putting out there. And I think today, more than ever, um, you know, consumers are looking for an additional reason other than just a great product. What is the cause that speaks to them that's really around the product? Obviously, Tom's doing that many, many years ago. Really, it was a great connection point. There's a litany of other brands, but, um, you know, we really, you know, I, I like to say to people all the time when they ask me the question of, you know, do you enjoy the small brands or do you enjoy the big brands? And my answer to that is there's positives on all of it. Um, but I enjoy the hustle of the small brands. <laughs> I enjoy sort of the challenge of status quo and, and try to win the day and do things differently and, and take big swings and go get it. And, and I think that sort of entrepreneurial mentality of starting out in business early on has, has been a great contributor to success for me at bigger brands that I've been at along the way. Um, it's also caused some frustrations from time to time because you realize you, know, you want to move at 100 miles an hour and sometimes the entity won't. But um, you know, we certainly never went into retailers sort of in this, this rogue way and, and did that way. We tried to, as much as we could, you know, make sure we got the proper permission. But um, it was amazing that example I gave, the difference in our brand and the lift and our sell-throughs. And obviously there are other contributing factors that, that help, but the amount of, of product that got sold because these store associates felt like we cared about them, we talked to them. We even took it a step further where uh, once it got rolled and we created an internship program as part of it also. And so we created this opportunity for these store associates who feel like they're a million miles away from a brand they love and a corporate office they love. And when you actually say to them, first of all, I'm gonna give you a t-shirt, that's a big deal. Like I remember when I got in the business, I didn't have a t-shirt and I was like, that's awesome. But then if you also told me that there was a chance to go work at the corporate office of a brand I really loved, if I just hustled more, I was like, I'm in for that. And so, you know, again, trying to find this connection point constant with these consumers was far more valuable than I think the multi-million dollar campaign Uh, this is another question for Justin. Can you talk about, because uh, I used to watch it all the time, the N1 Big State like, yeah. basketball series? And like, I don't know, I'm curious what, like, one, your involvement, where that kind of came from, if you can speak to it, and like, how did that elevate or maybe not so much elevate the brand? It feels like there's a ton of exposure for it, but like, I'm just curious if you could speak to that. Yeah, so uh, I'll ask you at the end, like, who your favorite player was uh, in that <laughs> process. But so the short answer, it was, Total luck. luck, like total 100% luck to start out. So the the story, uh, your name again? Max. Max just asked me is, so we had this uh, eventually, it started out as a videotape and it eventually became a tour, a basketball tour around the world that had its own TV show on ESPN. <laughs> so the luck part is that the story, my wife's in the, in the audience and so she knows the story really well is that pre kind of the business taking off, like we lived at the office. Like it was just work all day, play hoops at lunch, hang out, watch hoops, and just be connected to the sport. And I think it really is when you think about what makes great brands, it is solving a problem or it is a real sincere connection to what you love. 
So this tape uh, came from Rafer Alston, also known as Skip to My Lou. He is a basketball legend in New York City. And by pure luck, it got sent to our office through some, some friends. We had actually signed Rafer, and he sent this, this to us. And so somebody put it in one night, and it was this grainy tape of Rucker Park and Skip to My Lou just doing crazy work on guys, doing crazy you know, street ball moves, etc. And somebody at the time, one of our partners said, we should try, we were launching this new shoe, we should use this as a GWP with this product that we're getting ready to launch with Foot Action, who at the time was our biggest partner. And so we produced these things called And One Mixtape Volume One. Go look on it today on YouTube. Trust me, you won't be uh, disappointed. And we attached it to this product at Foot Action. We said, just try on the product and you can get this tape. And we didn't market it, we didn't do anything, and it literally took off. Like it became this underground, like unbelievable connection. A lot of people said we ruined basketball. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure if we did that. That's a, that's a pretty big responsibility. Um, but that tape grew into 10 tapes. We, we launched one almost every year. It then grew into a team of legends around the country. It then grew into a tour around the country that literally was like, I shouldn't say it as a bad example, like the Jackson 5, like people were pounding on the bus, following this bus, like craziness. Um, and it took off and we eventually did, did a global tour. I uh, was running Asia Pacific at the time. We did tours in Japan and the Philippines. And when you're in uh, Manila, uh, you know, where one of the greatest boxing events of all time and there are 30,000 people chanting about your brand and basketball and everything else, like that's a pretty big aha moment in where it went. So, you know, there's no chance to say how big it took it, but the amount of marketing and the connection point with kids and the consumers, and you still keep see kids today talking about N1 mixtape, or you hear announcers on TV saying that was a mixtape move, and that hasn't been around for like 10 or 15 years. So that was another sort of, you fell into it, it turned into something, everybody looked really smart along the way, and, and you really just w rode the wave, and um, phenomenal, phenomenal uh, push for the brand, for sure. So who's your favorite player? Oh, professor. Professor, Portland, Oregon. Good call. Yeah. Uh, any other <laughs> questions anybody has? Um, maybe, Chris, I might let you have the last word. Chris also has taught, uh, been an adjunct professor uh, teaching entrepreneurship uh, for the last number of years. So uh, any kind of, uh, what, what are the kind of pearls of wisdom you try to leave your, your, your students with as they're, you know, trying to grow and build and building and establish grow businesses? Thanks, Chris. So I'm an adjunct at Fairfield University in Fairfield, Connecticut. I teach an entrepreneurship class for the capstone. I do it maybe every other semester. I'm actually teaching this semester. And I think it is, and we're hearing it from, from these guys, certainly, and it, it is the idea that you can actually achieve all of these things. You just have to think differently, right? If, again, this is sort of comparing Cadillac to, to, um, to, to Jim's coffee business. It's not about spending $450 million a year on advertising. It's about figuring how to spend that money and connect to consumers. So I tell entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial students, these kids from Fairfield, who might have ideas like, you just think through the process, ask a lot of questions, keep your ears open, and there's an opportunity to beat the big guys. Back to Justin was saying, you know, the big companies have to watch out every day for the smaller brands that are picking around the side, because they're up in, you know, I was there at Cadillac, we're up in a tower, going to the Super Bowl and the Oscars, not paying attention to Elon Musk up in Northern California building a luxury electric car, and then all of a sudden he's now owns the owns the luxury market. So um, it's an exciting time to be in business. It is of all ages. I think it's that's what I, the other thing I say to the kids. You know, they're 21 years old coming out of school. But um, that's my plug for Fairfield University. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, thank you for joining me and thanking you.